Welcome to the second part of uh, Thy Kingdom Come series. And uh, for this particular part, our study is going to focus on the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Now, in this uh, study, I want us to look at how believers later on had an understanding of what uh, the Kingdom of God was all about. Then we shall look at the prophecies about persecutions and how the unity of the early church was, you know, even during that time of the persecution. But with time, uh, there was a very big change in Christianity, and with that change came the emergency of a new kind of unity, an organized kind of unity. And by the time the Western Roman Empire fell, um, we see another political religious power that began to rise, you know, um, uh, in that European region of the world. Now, let us start with. Um, so let us start with how uh, early Christians, you know, began to understand what Christ meant when he talked about the kingdom of God is at hand. You know, they started having. Um, they, they started having an understanding, they had a revelation of how the kingdom of God would come. Remember that uh, after he died, there was that big discouragement of, uh, you know, their hopes getting shattered. They had hoped Christ had come to now restore the kingdom of Israel, you know, away from uh, this Roman Empire. But... Um, Believers started understanding that the coming of the kingdom of God won't be like the way worldly empires were coming. Now, a worldly empire comes with observation. It has a certain kind of a structure, an announcement which is made. There is a way, you know, uh, it gets orchestrated. But the kingdom of God wouldn't come that way. Okay, it's a spiritual kingdom. Although later on, ultimately, it has to manifest even in the physical when Christ comes to rule this world. In Luke 17 verse 21, the Lord Jesus Christ mentioned a very profound truth. Let me just read that. Luke 17 verse 21. The Lord Jesus says, actually let me start it from verse 20. Because you need to know that Everyone, all the Israelites were interested in seeing uh, the realization, the manifestation of this kingdom. And so Luke 17 verse 20, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Now that is very important because uh, he, is, um, he is drawing our attention to the fact that this is not... This is something different. It's not like the political kingdoms of the world whose basic form is just at the physical level of pomp, noise, and, you know, um, uh, trying to show its dominance. But the Lord Jesus says, Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. It is going to start with God um, doing a work inside the hearts of those who will be chosen, uh, you know, to, uh, to be in that kingdom. So it has to begin with uh, a work that goes, God does inside our hearts. Now, the other important thing that believers started understanding was that uh, the first coming of Christ was not to, uh, to bring about the physical manifestation of this kingdom. It would come in phases, and Christ's first coming was not, uh, you know, the, 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 the manifestation, you know, of that kingdom coming with power, you know. Um, when you read, for example, in Isaiah 53, verse 3 to 7, you find a prophecy there which actually had foretold that before Christ can rule, um, he would have to pay the price for redemption. So Isaiah 53 and verse 3 to 7, it says, um, He is despised and rejected of men. Okay? This prophecy is about 
this person who will be the Messiah, who will be the king, you know, in this kingdom of God. It says, he is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Um, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. This is an exact description of what the Christ, you know, went through, that he would pay this price for what papers to take away our iniquity. Now Hebrews 9 verse 28 is another portion that tells us of what this Messiah will have to go through first, you know, before he can, uh, before he can uh, come to rule and establish his kingdom. Hebrews 9 verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So the writer of Hebrews actually now makes it plain that there is the first coming of Christ and there is the second coming of Christ. The first one was uh, unto salvation, okay, to pay the price for our redemption, but the second one will be to come, you know, and establish his kingdom okay um, and so here it says shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation and this is you're talking of salvation manifesting even at the physical level where the, the 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 kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of christ all right so you can read other uh verses that i believe uh, you are seeing on the screen and then um when you go over to revelation 17 verse 4 Revelation 17 verse 4, we see another interesting insight there. Revelation 17 verse 14, uh, this is a vision John had describing how, you know, the Christ would come now uh, to come and, you know, establish his kingdom. And he is not coming alone, but he is with other people riding on horses with him, people who would have been raptured and now they are coming to rule with him. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and they that are with him. So he is coming with these people, you know, to fight this great war as he comes to take over the kingdoms of the world. And these that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So these are saints of God. And now another important thing that is mentioned uh, in these uh, prophecies, you know, which made these believers have a better understanding of certain events that will come to pass before the physical realization of this kingdom. Um, one important thing that comes out in the prophecies is that there will be persecutions, persecutions of the saints. When you read Revelation 20 verse 4, it says, And I saw thrones. Now, does that remind you of something? There's something which strikes uh, quite a similar chord of what we read uh, in the first part of this series in the book of Daniel. When Daniel saw in those visions in Daniel chapter 7, he also saw, you know, uh, the throne being established of this one who looked like the son of man. And here in Revelation 20 verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So this now portion of scripture tells us, um, you know, when Christ will come and rule for 1,000 years, and he doesn't just rule alone, but there are these other thrones of the saints, you know, and a number of these saints were those who, who had died, you know, for the cause of the gospel, for the cause of Christ, you know, for the testimony they had. 
All right, so now what we see in this is there was an understanding of what the kingdom of God, how it would unfold, you know, the various phases of prophecy. Now, I want us to look at the prophecy of how saints would be persecuted. Now, when you read Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7 to 9, Uh, Daniel chapter 7 verse 7 uh, to 9 um, it speaks of the character of the fourth beast and certain terrible things this beast was doing and uh, you can read all the details of those verses in your own time but I'm going to read portions of it after this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly and it had great iron teeth it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, this verse speaks of how terrible this beast is, how it goes about destroying and damaging things. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down. Now, of course, uh, this portion speaks of, um, uh, sorry, uh, I'm supposed to read verse 8. Verse 8 says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and the mouth speaking great things. Now, I want you to observe one thing here. The two verses we've read, verse 7 and verse 8, they just speak about how terrible, how bad this beast was. But then, we are now told there's this little horn that arises, um, you know, from among the ten horns, and as it rises up, it destroys three horns. Okay? But at this point, we are not told anything about persecution of the saints. It is an overall description of how this beast is terrible and it destroys. And of course, in its destructive activities, many people suffer. But it is later on we, when Daniel is... Uh, intrigued about the details of this fourth beast what does it mean that more details come up and at that point he is told that the little horn is actually persecuting the saints and you find that in verse 19 to 21 uh, let me read that then i would know the truth of the fourth beast so he desired to know the truth the meaning the revelation of the fourth beast then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, breaking pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and now, notice, here now we are seeing details about the little horn persecuting not just in general terms to say it was persecuting people, but it was persecuting the saints. And you, uh, uh, that was verse uh, 20. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Now what I want to bring your attention at this point is although this little horn whom we shall look at uh, shortly although um, he is mentioned to have persecuted the saints what I want you to notice is that um, the little horn is just an embodiment of persecutions which had actually already started before the little horn came up and we're going to look into history to look at that uh, even before the rise of the little horn the pagan Roman Empire had been so ruthless, having no regard for human life. So now, during the time of the Roman Empire, which if you remember started under um, the leadership of um, Augustus, okay, and Augustus was a good man, well, most people considered him so, but um, other emperors who succeeded him were actually quite very terrible and um, they carried out a lot of persecutions you know against Christians 
Now, what you need to know is um, at the time of the Roman Empire, Israel is not an independent nation. It is under the rulership of uh, the Roman empires. And there were various pockets of revolts here and there of you know, the Jews wanting their independence. But uh, Rome managed to always suppress you know, any kind of such uprisings. And you need to know that um, during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the Pharisees found a way to implicate Jesus through that by saying he is claiming to be a king of the Jews. He's trying to claim to be the Messiah, someone who's going to serve this nation even away from the Roman Empire. Okay, and they knew that such kind of uh, information would easily implicate Jesus Christ. And well, you know the story by reading the Gospels. But now, beginning uh, uh, with the time of Nero, Okay, Nero was the sixth emperor. The first emperor was Augustus, but Nero was the, the sixth emperor. Now, it was during his reign that the first Christian persecution started. It was a terrible persecution, okay? And um, when you read Fox's book of Matthias, you can find very disturbing details of how Christians actually suffered. And um, I get this quote from Fox's book of Matthias, and this is about Nero. He reigned for the space of five years with tolerable credit to himself, but then gave way to the greatest extravagance, uh, extravagancy of temper and to the most atrocious barbarities. You know, he started, you know, killing the Christians. And it continues saying, Nero contrived all manner of punishments for the Christians that the most infernal imagination could design. He had some sued up in, he had some sued up in skins of wild beasts, you know, where you take these people and you cover them up in skins of animals, you know, like uh, <clears throat> impalas or whatever animals were being used in skins of wild beasts and then uh, worried by dogs until they expired and others dressed in shirts made stiff with wax, fixed to axle trees and set on fire in his gardens. For what purpose? Why was he taking these Christians, covering them up in wax, and then burning them? For what purpose? To illuminate them. You know, using them as candlelights in his garden. This persecution was general throughout the whole Roman Empire. Now I need to point out that it was during the time of Nero that Peter was killed and Paul was killed. Of course, many other Christians were killed, but these are notable people that, you know, you may be acquainted with in the scriptures. Peter and Paul were killed during um, the time of Nero. Then over in uh, 80 AD, a second wave of persecutions began. This was under the emperor Domitian. A new law was passed that um, if you are a Christian and you renounce your faith, you say, okay, I'm no longer a Christian, then you won't be punished. But if you don't to renounce your faith, then you will be punished. You will be persecuted. And at this time, there was so much superstition in the Roman Empire. You know, for example, if there is a famine, these people believe that the gods are angry. And now what started happening with these superstitious, uh, superstitious beliefs, whenever they had a famine, whenever there was an earthquake, it was all blamed on Christians. They are the causes. They are making our gods angry because they are converting, you know, they, they try to convert... Um, uh, Romans from their idols and all that and so the gods get angry. So whenever there was a terrible um, you know famine, earthquake, Christians were always you know the ones spotted to be the cause of all such things. Now um, notable Bible characters that died during the second wave of persecution under Emperor Domitian were uh, people like uh, Timothy and also uh, the Bishop of, uh, I mean, uh, Simeon, the Bishop of Jerusalem. You know, these uh, brothers, they died during the second wave of the persecution. And um, just before I talk about the tenth persecution, you know, Timothy died in a, in a bad way. One time he saw a procession of these pagans, I think they had a feast uh, to worship their God. And when he saw this procession, these people moving about with their songs, 
worshipping idols. That thing disturbed Timothy, you know. And he could not contain his anger. He spoke out, telling the people, this is paganism, this is not right, you know, you need to worship the one true God. And, and this mob got angry and agitated and they fell on Timothy. They beat him so badly. I think he died after two or three days, you know. And, well, so many persecutions happened over time, but uh, we can't cover all the details of all these uh, persecutions. You can read them in Fox's book of Matthias. But um, of great interest is the persecutions that happened during um, the reign of Diocletian. That was in the 4th century. Okay, and it was the 10th wave of persecutions. And the image of this man you are seeing here, uh, Diocletian, this man was evil, you know, he was very wicked. He was born in uh, 240 BC, and it was during this time that the Roman Empire had a lot of power struggles, you know, uh, different people killing each other to want to ascend to the throne. And you call that in history the third century crisis, okay, it happened during the 200 BC and this Diocletian was born in 240 BC during this time of the third century crisis. But you know he started growing up through the ranks of the army until he became an emperor and he became so fully determined to crush all the instability that was happening in his empire. You know and he was so ruthless he wanted to he did all these things to bring order in his empire you know so that all these wrangles and you know, uh, can be put to an end. So he he came up with uh, a certain system of administration that would uh, consolidate, you know, the power of the Roman Empire. So in 285 AD, he divided the whole empire into two halves. There was the Western Empire and the Eastern Empire. And you need to understand that on the eastern side of the Roman Empire, there was always a constant threat of... Uh, invasions, especially from the Persian forces. And so he decided to have someone oversee the affairs that were happening on the eastern frontiers, okay, to guard against the Persian forces. So at this time you have Western Roman Empire and Eastern Roman Empire, which further got um, uh, the system of administration would have an emperor in the east, an emperor in the west, and under them they would have deputies. And so it was actually a kind of a system where you have uh, four heads. The empire was being uh, governed by four heads. And that is why it was called the Tetrarchy system. Okay? You may come across those terms in the book of Acts, for example, the Tetrarch. All right. So, and this was the whole idea of uh, Diocletian. And now, what was happening was. Christianity, despite all the persecutions which were happening, it was growing, it was spreading to such an extent that some soldiers who were serving in the Roman Empire were actually Christians. And now what would happen is these Roman soldiers, it was, um, it was a custom that before you go for war, you need to make sacrifices. You sacrifice to the gods of Rome, you know the god of you know Mars and the planets and all that you know to give them sort of luck in fighting warfare and now that was a big problem for Christians who were also in the Roman army because they were not supposed to worship idols they were firm in their beliefs so what would happen is whenever they want to do a sacrifice well some Christians would say no I can't participate in this because um, I don't worship idols and Diocletian was about to put that to an end. Anyone who would refuse to participate in the sacrifice, you would have just exposed yourself as a Christian and you would be removed from the army and you know you risked being persecuted. And it so happened one time that uh, a fire had broken had broke out, you know, an inferno, and it gutted the imperial palace. And well, there was much likelihood it could have been started by these Romans and the whole idea was to blame it on the Christians. And when that happened, it just gave another wave to terrible persecution upon the Christians. In so much that the name of Christian was so obnoxious to the pagans that all 
indiscriminately fell uh, sacrifices to their you know, opinions. Many houses were set on fire and whole Christian families they perished in the flames. It was terrible. During Diocletian's time, Christians suffered terribly, you know, for their faith. And, you know, in all this, when you look at it, it's so amazing that uh, despite the way Christians were being killed, butchered, thrown to the flames, to the wild animals, here is one thing. Whenever historians, they try to record the successes of Diocletian. They'll talk about how strong his administration was, he had established the tetrarchy system and all that. But when they come to talk about his failures, there's one thing that stands out. It is said that no matter how he went full flesh trying to uh, obliterate Christianity, the more he killed Christians, the more they grew in number, the more they just became so widespread. I want to tell you one thing, that wasn't human strength. That was the spirit of God in these people's hearts. You know, to stand upon the rock and faith they were standing on. Is it not a shame today that we are so comfortable and we don't have the threat of being persecuted and killed in the manner these people are being killed? And it is at this time that there is so much lukewarmness and Christianity is just a confession on the lips. I want to tell you something, saints. The gospel that we believe, it is so filled with blood. Blood was shed. Just for you to read the Bible you are reading, people died for it. You know, and that should wake you up to know that giving your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ is a serious matter for which most of these beloved ones died giving up their lives. Now, here is one thing. Despite all the persecutions that were happening, there's one beautiful thing which used to happen in those centuries the unity christians were so united and the unit of the early church i want to read something to you uh from the britannica encyclopedia okay the 1962 edition page uh, 679 it's quite a thick book i have a copy you know and i was reading uh, in this encyclopedia and they were trying to describe what characterized the unity of the early church. And this is what they said. Though made up of widely scattered congregations, it was thought of as one body of Christ, one people of God. Intercommunication between the various Christian communities was very active. Christians upon a journey were always sure of a warm welcome and hospitable entertainment from their fellow disciples. Messengers and letters were sent freely from one church to another. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that amazing? But one thing I want you to notice is um, that was a unity that was orchestrated by the Spirit of God. And what I just quoted for you, what I read for you, was not written by Christians. This, that was written just by these secular historians. It's, 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 I'm quoting from Britannica Encyclopedia. And I'm emphasizing on this because through time, a strange kind of a unity orchestrated by human beings started coming up so different from what you just read. Um, here's one thing I want us to notice. Things that characterized the, the true unity that was in the early church. That unity was by the one power of the word of God. And this word supplied life to all the different joints of the body of Christ. Now, if you read Ephesians 4 verse 4 to 13, it speaks about a fivefold ministry which has to do its work until we come to the unity of faith. Now, the fivefold ministry feeds the body of Christ. So whatever you eat, out of that food, there are elements that will have to go to different joints of the body, different components that make up your body system. Uh, the calcium will need to sustain the, the bone structure and so on and so forth, you know. And the food you eat is one. And it is what, you know, defines the health of this body structure. It is what holds it up together. And so this is exactly the way um, God dealt with the early church, the way the unity manifested, you know, from the one power of the word 
you know, it supplied life to all the different joints of the body. And there are different examples we can look at in scripture of how the unity of the faith expressed itself. You know, uh, when you read uh, Ephesians 4 verse 11, there is one line which is important there. Let me see if I can, if I can read it. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. The unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now there's an example we can look at you know, in the book of uh, Acts where Peter was in prayer. He went to the, you know, rooftop. And as he was praying, God gives him a vision, you know, of unclean animals. And God tells him to kill and eat. And later on, he gets the understanding that God was speaking to him. He needed to proclaim the word of God to Gentiles who are considered unclean people. Now, what is interesting is, Peter was in the spirit. And God made him see that vision. God spoke to him. Now, the same spirit that spoke to Peter was working on the life of another man on the other end, Cornelius. Cornelius also had a visitation, and he was told that a man by the name of Simon, you know, will minister the word to him and his people. Here are two people who were geographically separated, and they were in different locations, but yet, by the voice of one spirit, they were both in the one faith. And this man Cornelius, who did not have the knowledge of the Son of God, was brought into that knowledge not because there was uh, a hierarchical system of some sort of bishop of bishops and you needed to recognize that man. That has nothing to do with the unity of the faith and the unity of the spirit. It is one person here dies to the flesh dies to his carnal ideas, yields his heart to God. Another person here does the same thing, is dying to his flesh, his carnal opinions, and the Spirit of God also fills him. These two persons, although in different locations, they are baptized into one spirit, into one faith, and they may not even know each other, yet the Spirit of God can lead them. I mean, think about a man like John Mark Lousy of Uganda, a man who was so isolated in that remote region of Karamoja. Uh, it did not take someone to tell him about William Branham and to bring him into the end time message faith, but he had a visitation of, you know, seeing uh, a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ and telling him that um, he was to be given an apostolic ministry. And later on, he had questions over sons of God and daughters of men, you know, that record in Genesis. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to him that there is someone God had sent in this world, and he explained on what the original sin is, and he would understand the time he would read the message. Can you imagine that? And out of this ministry of John Mark, Many people came to know the Lord, many people have come to know the message, and, well, there are no message missionaries who went to teach him this or that, but the same Spirit of God, whom, you know, William Branham served, whom other servants of God in other places of the world uh, served, the same God appeared to this man and brought him into the faith. It is one Spirit, and we are all baptized into one body of Christ. And when our hearts, our thoughts get aligned, you know, to the mind of God, then we will be in the unity of the faith, okay? So what you see is in the early church, you have people walking in humility and walking and being led by the Spirit. And one other thing that characterized uh, the unity in the early church was there was no person who was above the Word of God. You read about Paul, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11 to 14. He hears that there are some people who started some divisions. Other people saying, I am for, for Paul. He's the person I follow. You know, Others preferred following 
Apostle Peter. You know, they had these kind of ideas where they felt Peter was the servant of God. I can imagine them saying he's the one who was given the keys. So wherever you have human beings who are not walking in the spirit, when they see a servant of God being used by God, their eyes get focused on the flesh of that man. And Paul was aware. He noticed that some attitude was developing among these people. And guess what? He never encouraged that to think, yes, you know, I'm a servant of God. And he rebuked the people to say, is it Paul who died for you? Is it Cephas who died for you? Is it Apollos? He says, all these are just servants of God. Others planted, others watered, but it is God who giveth the increase. You know, that is something profound. That is something important that characterized the early church. They were very spiritual people. There's another incident in the book of Acts, chapter 14, verse 11 to 15, when these people were so impressed with the miraculous power of God working through the life of uh, Apostle Paul, you know, and they started worshipping these two men of God, saying, oh, these are gods. Now, today we may not call certain people gods, but you can see the reverence people have to certain personalities. They would revere that person as though he is a god, you know. And Paul was very quick to rebuke those people. He actually tore his clothes and said, we are human beings like you. So you can see how, you know, the early church, the kind of character it had, the preachers, you know, the men of God, there was no one above the correction of God's word. Even when a prominent man like Peter did something wrong, there wasn't a thing like, you know, he's a man, Christ gave the keys. You know, he was among those who saw the resurrection of Christ. When Peter did the wrong thing, the Bible says Paul rebuked Peter in front of the other elders to say, what you did was not right according to the word of God. So you can see that these people, uh, even those who were being used by God, there was a certain humility. And the only authority the men of God had was that of the word of God and the sincerity they needed to have in their lives. Alright? A very beautiful, true unity. But now, <clears throat> something happened in Christianity. I would call it a new dawn in Christendom. You know, there was now an emperor, Constantine. And Constantine was at war with another, you know, emperor. And something happened. There was this battle which was uh, uh, being fought. It was fought across the Milvian Bridge. So the battle is commonly called the Battle of Milvian Bridge, okay, by historians. And it was a very important battle which would change the course of history. And it still has, you know, we still feel the impact of it today. It changed the course of uh, world history. Because it was in this battle, now remember, Christians were being persecuted at this time. But uh, Constantine was very worried about this battle. And it so happened that he experienced a vision. This was in the year 312 AD. He experienced the vision, and in that vision he saw a cross. Now, at that time everyone knew a cross was the symbol of Christianity. So he saw a cross, and a voice spoke saying, In this sign, overcome. Well, that battle was so important, and this experience really um, did something to the mind and the heart of this emperor. So after coming out of the vision, he ordered all his soldiers to paint the, the symbol of the cross on their shields. You know, and he made a vow that, you know, he, he, he made it in his heart that if he's going to win by the message of that vision, then he will give freedom to the Christians. I mean, it was a profound thing, you know, having experienced a supernatural vision. And it so happened that Constantine won that battle. And you know what? The whole course of history changed. Out of that came the Edict of Milan, where it was proclaimed that Christians are now free. They were to be given fiscal and legal privileges. You know, all the property they lost was supposed to be restored back to them. It was just a big revolution. History had just turned a new page altogether in one day. And 
this man, this whole episode so much uh, impacted him that he offered to start building churches. For example, the St. Peter's Basilica, where the Pope is, it was built in that time. The Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, all these were built during that time. You may have seen them, I think I have some pictures here. Uh, this is the drawing by uh, an artist, H.W. Uh, uh, Brewer, and this was in 1891. But uh, of course it doesn't look like this today. It is being improved every now and then. This is how it looks, um, uh, St. Peter's uh, Basilica. All right, so this was a work of Constantine because of what had happened to him. He gave so much freedom to the Christians. But Constantine was worried of one thing. You know, he felt so personally involved in Christianity because of the experience he had and so, but when he started noticing the divisions, ugly divisions among Christians, he felt God may not be happy with what is going on and he saw in himself a vessel that God can use to hold Christianity together. So he decided to call um, for a council at Nicaea. That was in 325 AD. And what Constantine did was, you know, to give power to the bishops. You know, and at this time you need to understand that being a bishop was such a prestigious position because uh, among the things Constantine did was the clergy were not supposed to work. They were supposed to be paid. They were not supposed to pay tax. And uh, he really elevated these clergymen, you know, because he believed they were men of God. And so he wanted unity in the church, you know, and he didn't want one group teaches this, another group teaches that. So a council of bishops, what you call the episcopate, you know, was convened where they had to agree. And one important thing that was agreed during this meeting was the doctrine of the Trinity, that the Son, the Father, the Holy Spirit, they are all equal. But there was another priest who held a different view, and that was Arius. Him, he believed Jesus, the Son of God, is not the same as the Father because the Son was begotten. But at this Council of Nicaea, it was agreed that we believe in the Holy Trinity. And everyone had to subscribe to that, okay? And that was the beginning of uh, something that would lead to the, uh, the papacy, okay? Because after the Council of Nicaea, you had other men rise, like Saint Augustine of Hippo. He championed, uh, you know, this thing of um, the visible headship of Christ on earth, where people needed to believe, they needed to have a physical leader on earth who stands in the place of Christ. You know, so he had this concept called uh, Civitas Terrena, where th that means um, the, the region of the earth needs to be ruled by a visible head. And with time, uh, the ideas of Augustine and other scholars who came up you know, led to the papacy, wherein it was believed that the papacy represents Christ on earth. And so it became such a very powerful institution. Now, let me just uh, read uh, this. Uh, I am getting this from uh, Britannica Encyclopedia again, uh, 1962 edition, page 679. Uh, Augustine claimed that the papacy was supreme over all the nations of the earth which make up the civitas terrena or earthly state. Augustine's theory was ultimately accepted everywhere in the West and thus the church of the Middle Ages was regarded not only as the sole act of salvation but also as the ultimate authority, moral, intellectual and political. Upon this doctrine was built, not by Augustine himself, but by others who came after him, the structure of the papacy, the Bishop of Rome, being finally recognized as the head under Christ of the Civitas Day, and so the supreme organ of divine authority on earth. Okay, and well, what you see from this is, because of uh, Constantine, there was so much... Um, privilege which was given to the church and uh, particularly the, the leaders of the church system and in a way now you know they had influence on the political systems and when you read scriptures like Luke 12 verse 32 in which the Lord Jesus said fear not little flock 
Well, one thing you can see clearly, you don't need to be a theologian, one thing you need to, uh, one thing that you see from that is this was clearly not a little flock. <laughs> uh, the, the, the Constantine's uh, church was not a little flock. There was so much great transformation. The church had united with the state and it became such a formidable force and very influential in political affairs you know, of, uh, uh, of uh, the empire. And in a way I would say um, what you call the church had accepted what Christ rejected. If you remember in Luke chapter 4 verse 5 to 7, Satan had offered Jesus, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world if you bow down and worship me. The Lord refused doing that. But you know what? These religious people could not see Satan camouflaged in the unit of the church and state. Because what was to turn out now was persecution. Not pagan Rome persecuting Christians, but the Holy Roman Empire using the arm of the church. Whoever would disagree to certain things that had been agreed at the Council of Nicaea would be persecuted. And people who were in big problems were those uh, who believed in the doctrines of Arius. You know, he, he did not believe in the Trinity. Now, I need to mention at this time that um, the Roman Empire had always had a trouble of the neighboring tribes, the Germanic tribes, you know, trying to invert it. And that went on so consistently over a period of time. And you know, the Germans were tall, huge, and they really gave a nightmare to the Roman Empire. And the barbaric invasions continued over a period of time until the empire was gradually weakening. By the time you come to the year 476 AD, the empire had actually dismembered into 10 provinces. Okay, you had um, Anglo-Saxon, you had uh, Suevi, you had, you know, those different ancient names. But it got, it disintegrated into these, uh, uh, into these uh, 10 nations. And during that time, you know, when it had disintegrated, there wasn't one emperor like ruling over this whole region because it disintegrated. One thing you need to see is Christianity had spread over the region and it became somewhat like a social glue that bound, you know, the different cultures of people. And this Christianity at the helm of it was the papacy. And it goes without saying that the papacy became the voice of unity. It became um, a new authority, so to speak, uh, so to speak, you know, which uh, united these uh, ten nations. They looked to the papacy as a source of continuity, authority, and direction. Okay, because uh, it was through the papacy that you have Christianity, and through Christianity, these different states. Um, are able at least to see something eye to eye and that is Christianity and I'm talking about traditional Christianity as was espoused by the Catholic uh, uh, by Catholicism and what you see is the papacy became such a powerful force that uh, in the year 538 AD there are these uh, three nations out of ten which you know uh, had broken down to, you know, you know, these ten nations that emerged from uh, the Roman Empire. Now there are three nations which subscribed to Arius' doctrine of not believing Christ and the Father to be eternal. And you need to know that in that time matters of belief were very political. You could be killed if uh, you took a different stance. And what happened is these three countries, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths and Heruli, um, you know, they were Arias in orientation, or, you know, in their beliefs system. And that didn't go well with the Pope. He sent his armies and the three countries, to this day you can't see them on the map, they were completely uprooted and obliterated. Okay, but you see the other ones, they're still here today, like Britain, Spain, and, you know, and 
in 800 AD when Pope Leo had crowned a certain uh, uh, person is it Charlemagne you know as the emperor he set a precedent you know uh, where all the rulers for you to become a ruler you needed to be crowned by the papal powers and so that, that was a precedent set and it further um, you know uh, strengthened the hold of uh, the papacy over these nations and by the time you come to the 11 um, what's this uh, 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 in the year 1095 AD uh, Pope Urban II started the Crusades now do you know what the Crusades are this was a time when Muslims you know they they had overtaken the Holy, the Holy Land Israel Jerusalem you know um, this was uh, you know the uh, uh, the time when the Mohammedans they they uh, they invaded you know the holy city and they took over this uh, Middle East region and Pope Urban felt Christians needed to fight to regain the Holy Land you know the place where the Lord was crucified where the Lord was and so that was the beginning of the Crusades these were wars against uh, Islamic domination of the Holy Land and so Pope Urban became a voice that echoed through that whole European region to say we need to stand up we need to fight and this became so important even for the eastern region of the Empire now remember when Western Rome had fallen in 476 AD the Eastern Roman Empire was still intact and um, you know these emperors somewhat felt they were still superior to the papacy which now seemed to be so powerful in this other western half but during the crusades Pope Urban was able to garner up you know this support of soldiers different men and women they were ready to give their lives to fight in the army to rescue Palestine out of uh, Muslim uh, domination and because of that you know the papacy became the figurehead a unifying voice and even the Eastern uh, Roman Empire they found in the Pope assistance and a force that would unite people to fight and because of that you know the papacy had further consolidated its power and so what you see now is a new picture altogether what you are seeing here is the fulfillment of prophecy in Daniel chapter 7 remember there was a little horn which rose and uprooted three horns it is without question that the papacy is clearly identified you know in the emergency you know um, uh, of that little horn you know and um, it, it, uh, it was able to fulfill the uprooting of those three nations and it became such a strong powerful voice you know in that time and so powerful that for you to be crowned a ruler you had to be crowned by the papacy itself and so what you see is Western Rome had fallen and out of that the papacy you know consolidated itself by the time you come to the period of the Crusades the papacy was such a very important force and over the next coming years it was always antagonizing with these uh, monarchs all right and so this is our study for today and we feel it is important to dig through into this history you know because that enables us to have a very good understanding of uh, prophecy when we read through you know the book of Daniel and so what we see in the picture is the fourth beast how diverse it was started as a monarch turned into a republic turned into an empire a pagan uh, Roman Empire then later on it became the Holy Roman Empire being led by you know um, uh, uh, you know these popes okay and what we shall look at in the next study are the persecutions that started happening not under pagan Rome but under the papal authorities. Lord richly bless you.